guys and welcome to episode 13 of the Face It podcast. Today I am joined by Dr. Kataria, who is the CEO and founder of Juvan Medical and also the in-house doctor and medical director for Lumifil. He has years of experience in both surgery and aesthetic medicine and now focuses his expertise solely in non-surgical facelifts and full facial rejuvenation on clients internationally. So welcome Dr. Kataria and thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you for the invite Holly. You're more than welcome. So I'm so excited to be speaking with you because we've got a number of different topics that we're going to cover which I think a lot of practitioners um, will find really really helpful um, but also we have just launched a new campaign with Lumifil which is super exciting so obviously we'll go into that as well um, but do you want to just start off by telling us a bit about your background and how you got yourself into the aesthetics field? Yeah of course so I graduated as a medical doctor and for me it was really interesting throughout medical school for the last three years you spend your time doing clinical placements in different hospital rotations. And for me, I was instantly drawn to cosmetic surgery. Um, the first time I went in, and I still remember this so vividly, I was watching a facelift happen just as a medical student. And it was so exciting to see how you can transform how someone looks. Yeah. And as a medical student, you then follow them along their journey. So you see them post-op, you see them heal. And... You also get to see the other side of surgery, which is how a patient really feels and the impact it has on them emotionally um, after a treatment. So I always was fascinated with uh, cosmetic surgery and throughout medical school, we ran surgical workshops. Um, and then I stumbled into aesthetics. And for me, aesthetics was a natural calling because it allowed you to transform a face with minimal downtime an instant result. And you also got to follow your patient on a journey and develop a relationship with them and see how that evolves. And that was really how I first got into aesthetic medicine. Yeah, amazing. So I think, you know, that's quite a common theme when I speak to people on the podcast. It's putting the client first and having the client kind of at the core of everything you do. And I think, like you've just pointed out, that is one of the most amazing things about the aesthetics industry is it sits within sort of beauty and surgery, you know, little downtime. Absolutely. You can go into a clinic for an hour and have a couple of different treatments and you're not spending six weeks recovering. Um, yes. And also the impact that it, it has on that person as well, like you say, might be helping an insecurity they have or, you know, they might have had surgery in the past due to a medical condition and aesthetics can actually um help treat that um and treat the look of it as well um so I absolutely love that you've said that that's amazing um so obviously you work with Lumifil and you're their uh, medical director which is fantastic as well so do you want to just tell us a bit about that and how you started working with them yeah of course um so I came across Lumifil very soon after it launched. And what really struck me about Lumifil is that Lumifil's invested very heavily in its clinical trial and testing. So with all dermal filler products, and there's such a huge variety on the market now, um, it's often very hard for a practitioner to know which product should I use, which brand should I trust, and what are my reasons for choosing this product? Because we all want to deliver the very best results for our patients. And of course, product choice plays a very important role. Um, so with Lumefill, we kind of went through clinical trials and you know, seeing a product which has zero BDDE. And for those who don't know, BDDE is a product within hyaluronic acid gels that determines how pure the product that you're injecting is. So you have some products that are very trace amounts. So they're still great products and they're what you classify as pure hyaluronic acid gels. Whereas with Lumefill, it comes with zero BDDE. And so it's classified actually as a very premium, ultra pure gel. And um, the team is fantastic. They're very focused on delivering, you know, an excellent customer service. And the values for the industry themselves was what really stood out. So together we developed a way to train practitioners in the products. Um, whilst also giving them the very best products. Amazing. And I think the fact that obviously you're so experienced in what you do, for you to actually say like, guys, you need to be using this product like for these reasons. I think a lot of practitioners should have some reassurance that you're actually recommending this and you use it with your training, you use it on your own patients as well. And I think you're right in terms of what you said 
about, you know, there's just so much choice out there. You know, when someone qualifies, they'll yes. normally just go for the dermal filler that they were trained in, I suppose, because, you know, what else would they choose? Um, so actually trying to figure out what works for them and their clients is is a difficult task within itself because you'll you'll see people on Facebook saying, use this, use this, use this. And as a practitioner, you're like, hold on, like, I just, I need a trusted brand that is going to deliver good results. And that's exactly what Lumifor does. So if you've not yet tried it, you absolutely should be. Do you want to tell us a bit um, about um, your kind of full facial rejuvenation treatments and the types of kind of results you can um, get with Lumifor? Of course. Um, so a full face rejuvenation treatment is what I like to call looking at a patient from every level, assessing exactly what they need and tailoring a treatment plan, which is individualized exactly to them. So when we look at aesthetic medicine as a whole, it's a very interesting journey that aesthetic medicine has been on in the last 20 years. We went from at the very start where injectors would look at a patient and they would assess a single problem. So they'd look at someone and think, see no smell lines, or I can see that the lip needs a little bit of volume. And what we were really doing was treating individual areas. And we then slowly moved to a 3D model. So a 2D is where we're looking at a patient front on, looking for a single problem and assessing to treat it. A 3D model is where then we started to realize we need to look at a patient from every angle. So we'd start all looking at them from the side view, assessing the side view, coming at 45 degrees, seeing is there any shadows, seeing is there any volume loss, where can we add definition, where can we add lift? And we'd work through that and develop a plan accordingly. With the full face rejuvenation treatments, these are what we call 4D treatments. And by 4D, we're looking at our patient from every angle. And then the fourth dimension is looking at our patient's emotion, expression, uh, and the way that they communicate with someone. So we're really looking, how is the face moving as a whole? How are they smiling? How are they displaying affection? How are they displaying anger? because our face naturally changes. And it's so important that we optimize how the face looks and keep a balanced look. So yeah. the full face rejuvenation is really focused on bringing a patient in for an accurate assessment, developing a detailed treatment plan, and then executing that treatment plan but on, with a very personalized element to them. Amazing. Do you know what? I've never thought of it in terms of the, the final element that you said with the emotion and how the face moves I mean I'm not a practitioner myself but you know like you said there's no one size fits all when it comes to aesthetics you know I think even 10 years ago it was like okay lips cheeks jaw and yes. that's how it was it's just like building blocks whereas now I think practitioners should feel excited but also encouraged to be a lot more kind of specialized and bespoke when it comes to injecting their client's face because not only is that going to benefit the client because you're going to get better results if you're spending a lot more time thinking about it and, and looking at their face but also it's going to build that relationship as well because you're creating that journey with them aren't you of course and you know our patients are becoming more and more educated about aesthetics and um, yeah. if we go back to the very start patients were not very aware of what's possible or even what kind of look that they wanted. Yeah. So what we used to see is that a patient would come into a clinic and the first thing on their mind is, I really want to see something noticeable. I want to be able to demonstrate that I've come in and had a treatment. Yeah. And so we went through a phase where we saw a trend of lips being extremely volumized, cheekbones yeah. extremely high. Um, but what we're now seeing is that as education about aesthetics, gets more and more advanced. Our patients are learning more. And now when they're coming into clinic, what they're looking for is balance, definition, precision. They want something subtle and undetectable. Um, and the way that we inject and the products that we use and the, the technique protocols that we use has to adapt with that. And I see that worldwide when we go training doctors in Dubai, when I see in Europe, when we run masterclass sessions or full face treatments, this is a universal trend now that we're seeing that patients in every country are realizing that subtle and noticeable is what's going to give them a great long term investment return on their investment. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that's such a positive thing as well. You know, 
there there's obviously so many negatives when it comes to social media but you know like you said their knowledge is so much better now on what aesthetics can actually do in a positive way um and yeah I think even when I first started getting dermal filler like 10 years ago I I just was like oh my mates are getting lip filler so I'll get it as well like I didn't have any real reasoning as to why I just wanted to get it because everyone else did and I think as well you know back in the day you just trusted whoever was injecting you no, I didn't know anything about their background or, you know, protocol or anything like that. Whereas now clients are really aware of that. And what they're looking for is to actually build a relationship with that injector so that they can go on that journey with them. You know, I think clients are very specific around who they go to nowadays, which also is a good thing, I think. I think so. And I think as a practitioner, we often think of what makes a successful clinic or or what makes a successful practitioner? And actually, it's not seeing super, super high volume patients and seeing them once and then finding a new patient. What you really want to have is you want to have that one patient and you develop this long relationship with them. And the way that we inject and the way that we treat them will adjust every time they visit based upon where they are in their point of life and the kind of look that they want. And there is a lot of trust between a patient and an injector, um, you know, and it's a huge responsibility that I think injectors should really take on board because you're absolutely right. We're not affecting the way someone looks. We're also affecting the way that they're perceived by others and we're affecting their social interactions. You know, studies show that the way that you look has a new, um, different impact on your life. It can affect job opportunities. It affects relationships. Um, it affects every single aspect from self-confidence. And so it's really important as a practitioner that you really get to understand your patient and you take the time to individualize a bespoke treatment plan that takes all of these factors into account. Absolutely. And that even ties in with, you know, clients of different ages. You know, somebody who's 21 is going to be totally different to somebody who's 61 in terms of, the treatments that they need, that the, you know, the placement of the dermal filler or whatever treatment they're having. Um, so what advice would you give to a practitioner who, let's say they've just qualified, most of the models that they injected were young girls, for example, but they're, they're looking to further their knowledge and education on kind of a whole spectrum of different people. Like, where would you even start with that? Okay, so... The first step really is, and the analogy that I always like to give as an artist, you know, as an artist is making a drawing or a painting, he doesn't use one paintbrush, he has several different paintbrushes. He doesn't have one palette of colour, he'll have a palette of colours which he'll then mix one colour with another, he'll add a touch of white to lighten it, he'll use different brush strokes, how hard he pushes on the canvas, how light he pushes on the canvas, he'll then alter the canvas, he'll alter the outer covering and then finally he'll frame the product. And as an aesthetic um, injector, it really is a combination of understanding the science, but then also having the techniques and tools to be able to apply those different techniques in different ways. So let's take lips, for example. Often you'll go on a training course and with lips, you will learn one technique. And that technique, you will then try to use on everyone because it's the way that you've been taught and you don't know which technique should I use. And when you're treating the full face, it's very similar. You're using techniques that you've learned in a cheat course, you're using techniques that you learned and you're trying to piece it together. When we're looking at the, say, the jawline of the cheek, there's actually six, seven, eight different techniques. And based upon the age of my patient, and by age, I don't just mean physical age. I mean, where is my patient in the aging process? You could have someone who's 60 and actually they've got really good volume in their face. They've been taking really good care of themselves and actually they just need very subtle touches. Um, And so I think the key is mastering the really advanced techniques, having a good vision, looking at your patient and thinking, which area do I actually need to treat? Um, And then bringing all of that together. Amazing. Yeah, there's just so much more to it, isn't there? And I think for practitioners who may be listening to this, 
they might feel a little bit overwhelmed, like thinking, oh my God, you know, I don't know any of this stuff. Like I just know how to do the most basic lip injections, which I learned on my course. And I really yeah. want to elevate my skills. Um, and you obviously offer master classes and training where they can actually learn all of this, don't you? So do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, of course. Um, so the master classes are really designed for very individualized training days. So they're held in extremely small groups and the focus is on treating the full face. Um, very often, you know, we're treating patients with six, seven, eight, nine mils of filler, which at first glance can sound like a lot. Um, but in reality, it's not a huge amount. And I often think that practitioners, they sometimes have a great vision. A patient will come in front of them and they, they can, they're looking at them and they're thinking, I need to treat the temples. I know that they need a little bit in the jawline. I want to give the chin a bit of length, but I don't want to project it too much. I want to treat the tear trough, but not overfill it. The nose could do with some narrowing. Um, but sometimes it's a lack of confidence in knowing how will I do all of that? And am I sure that I know the right technique for this patient? And that almost scares them from actually saying to the patient, um, this is my treatment plan for you. And I think that this is what we should go for. Um, so I think often, once you're confident and once you're trained in knowing how to treat the full face, you'll be far more confident in when you're assessing your patients yeah. um, and you'll be far more confident in saying to them, I think the right step here really is for us to treat your temples as opposed to let's do a small lip top up today. Yeah. Because lips are like your safety zone, lips are where you feel confident and safe. And it is really about pushing your like skill set out there but also matching that with the right training so you're operating in a safe and effective way. A hundred percent. I think confidence is something that so many practitioners do struggle with. You know, there's so many people who even do their training and then six months down the line, they've still not injected because they're just, they yeah. just don't want to take that step. But you're right, you've got to push yourself out of your comfort zone, build that relationship with your client. And remember that, you know, if, if, that's what you think that client needs or should have in terms of a treatment plan and they trust right. you go up just go and absolutely do it. go and yeah, do absolutely it. I mean, so many practitioners that i meet who come on a master class day they enter into aesthetics because a they've got a really big passion for it and that's super important because if you don't have a big passion for aesthetics or being able to transform the face your patients pick up on it so, you know, when I'm talking with a patient, I like to think that my passion for my job, it's almost being transferred onto them. Um, and second of all, it's also just, it's just really updating the knowledge and updating your technique and skill set. Um, and I think the statistics are quite, um, you're absolutely right. I think from everyone who trains and does a training course, only about 30 or 40% will still be injecting six months later. Wow. Um, and it is just a lack of confidence, it's just going and saying, that was a great training day, but I think I need more. I need more practice so I can feel more confident. Yeah, absolutely. And just on going back to sort of different types of clients and, and ages and everything, obviously there's men as well. And I think a lot of practitioners are so focused on marketing to women um and treating patients who are women that actually there's men as well which is 50 percent of the population and obviously you might th that might take more training as well in terms of um in terms of doing treatments on a on a male's face would you agree absolutely i mean as a trend we've seen a huge increase in the number of male clients so if I was to look at the number of patients that I treat, I would say it used to only be maybe five or 10% male. And now we're probably looking more at 20 to 25% of male. Mm -hmm. um, Botox remains the number one treatment in men uh, and this worldwide. Um, but what we're often seeing is that a male patient in general, because it's not exposed as much, there's a fear about how aesthetics will make them look. And the biggest fear that they have is, will I end up looking more feminine after this treatment? Yeah. So 
what we have to remember is there are gender variations. There are different ideals of beauty between male and female. And what I think practitioners should really be looking at is understanding um, you can masculinize the face and you can feminize the face. And the way you do that is using different techniques. Um, so I think social media is great. And I really wish there was a bit more of a push to show that actually soft touches, subtle touches in male will keep them looking super masculine, will keep them looking sharp. Um, and it'll also just make them feel rejuvenated. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're still getting there in terms of kind of normalizing men having treatments, I think, you know, I'm just thinking about all the, the men in my life, like, for example, my brother, yeah. if I said to him, oh, like, would you ever get some Botox? He'd probably be like, absolutely not. Because even the word Botox, whilst it's an anti-wrinkle treatment, he will associate that with lip filler. And I think right. a lot of men do because they just see it all as aesthetics as one and they see it as like 10 years ago and everyone wanted massive lips basically and I think if practitioners actually start marketing to men encouraging them to come into clinic you know doing a model day um actually um you know ex explaining about the benefits of anti-wrinkle injections and subtle small amounts of filler and what results it can give that is going to first of all increase your client base but secondly it's also going to give you more variation as well in terms of the types of people that you're injecting? Of course, I mean, the aging process is universal, right? It affects men just as much as it affects women. Yeah. Um, and so very often it's really trying to understand um, what their concerns are. Because I feel sometimes when a man comes to the clinic, he'll have a specific concern. And sometimes it's very hard to find and be able to express what that concern is. So for example, what we're seeing a lot more of now is patients come into the clinic and they're discussing what they're looking for in terms of an emotion. So they'll come in and say, I feel tired, or I feel I look a bit sad when I'm looking in the mirror. And what they're really trying to say to us is, I can see changes happening, but I don't know how to describe that to you. And that goes for both male and both female. That's a very subjective term, right? Saying that I look tired, it's really them coming to us saying, I want you to use your consultation and assessment skills and I want you to be able to figure out what it is that's making you look tired or what's yeah. making you look sad. Yeah. Um, and then I want you to be able to address that. And again, that just takes a little bit of confidence in your technique and your ability to assess and deliver a result to a patient. Yeah. Um, but I think once you can master that, then actually you'll find that the patients are coming to you because we all talk, right? We'll all have a treatment. We'll all go to a restaurant. We'll all go, uh, you know, whenever you've had excellent customer service um, in one area, it's very natural that you want to share that with someone. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think it is so much more than that. You know, some people, as you say, it's so subjective in terms of kind of how you think you look. But clients are looking for you to advise them and for you to say right I've got an idea let's do this what about a bit of this because you're the expert at the end of the day and they're not hence why they're coming to you for treatments and I think you know going back to my point around um clients are looking for an injector you know they want to be able to come in and say what do you think I need you know, not necessarily yeah. even book in for a specific treatment, but to get, have that trust in you that, you know, you will make the right decisions based on what you can see and your experience. Do you have clients who do that, who literally book in and they just say, what, what, what do you think I should get? Yeah, very often. I think, you know, aesthetics is such a vast field. And I think being able to set yourself apart with certain niche. So for myself, it's non-surgical facelift or the complete profile treatments. Um, it actually gives you a lot of freedom as an injector because patients will come to you and they trust your advice. They trust you to deliver for them the very best result, which is completely individualized to them. Mm -hmm. And as an injector, that's a great feeling because it allows me to assess a face and be able to deliver a really honest treatment plan. And that goes both ways. Sometimes I'll say, I don't think you need any more in this area. 
And I think it's really important that we don't put filler here. And for me to give my reasoning to them, um, one of the key things that we kind of cover in masterclasses, and it's a really, really kind of emerging trend is, patients will often come into a clinic and they will disguise what they really want or feel that they need with something else. So Why do you think that out. is just out of interest? I think it's because it's very difficult for them to express. Um, and sometimes it's because they don't really know um, whether somebody else will understand what they're feeling or seeing. So if you're a bit scared to express, it's a human reaction that you'll then cover that up with something else. And secretly inside, they're hoping that the practitioner will go, okay, you've come in for lips today. What I would like to do is I'd like to take a few minutes just to really assess the full face. Yeah. And as I'm assessing the full face, I'll work through everything. Um, and often, so many times I've seen it happen, they've come in for a specific thing, but then we've really uncovered what they're looking for. And that's the start of a great practitioner-patient relationship. Yeah. So as a rule of thumb for a first new patient, I will always spend 20 to 30 minutes in the consultation trying to really understand my patient, what's been going on. And it's, you know, so many times there are so many life stories in patients that unless you take the time to really understand what's drawn them in, um, you'll be amazed. I've seen patients, you know, who've it's been either a really terrible time in a relationship, it's been a medical illness, they've had chemotherapy. And sometimes if I was looking at them from the outside, I would never have guessed any of those yeah. things. Yeah. And if I didn't take the time to really understand them as a person, I wouldn't be able to understand how much it meant to them, but more importantly, what it is that's actually concerning them. And then after that, you start to develop this relationship where, okay, let me see a photo of you before your chemotherapy. Let's go through this together. Okay. okay. What we need to do here is develop a treatment plan. This is not something we can achieve in one sitting, but this is something which we have to build towards in three or four or five. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for a patient to come in, coming back to your earlier question and say, I've had chemotherapy, this is a photo, and I really want to go back to him. If, even if it takes me four months spread out, I don't mind. Whereas um, it's really on a practitioner to develop that relationship and build the trust and openness to communicate yeah a hundred percent because I think a lot of practitioners may just see it as work you know that you know that you, you get used to your job don't you like you know in terms of treating patients but actually that that appointment to that client might be their hour away from busy life at home away from a stressful job right. and just a time for them to actually go ah oh, right this is my time now and even, you know, talk about something that's going on. You know, it needs to be a safe space within that treatment room. And I completely agree. I think there's, you know, a lot of people who offer like 15 minute appointments and things like that. But you're not going to build that relationship with your client doing that. Yes, you might be turning over a lot of money if you're turning people in and out. But for me, if I was to book in with a practitioner... I, that would be like the highlight of my week, knowing that I'm going to the clinic, can have a nice chat, have a cup of tea, talk about what's going on and get some lovely treatments as well. And yes. I think sometimes practitioners lose sight of that, that it, it can be a really important time for the client to come in. Of course it is. And you can imagine how rewarding it is for a practitioner as well to be on the other side. And you watch your patient grow you watch them grow in self-confidence. Yeah. You watch them every time they come. Th th it's just the small things, you know. Um, that job opportunity, I really went for it this time after our last meeting. Yeah. And you, you watch them evolve and grow, and it's such a rewarding feeling seeing how a treatment impacts them in almost every aspect of their life. Yeah, 100%. Because it's not just appearance at all. It's how you feel. And, you know, like you say, how you feel the way like when I feel like I've woken up and I look horrendous I don't always have the best day whereas if I wake up and I think oh do you know what my skin looks really nice today like you just I have the be a better day of course, of course you do you know? yeah, absolutely and that's the same yeah. for absolutely everyone yeah 100 percent. so practitioners should apply that with their client base as well um but obviously you know 
coming in for a dermal filler treatment or a Botox treatment, I think a lot of clients might see as kind of that's going to fix all their insecurities and fix all their their problems. And I think it's really important to address the fact that aesthetic treatments are not a quick fix. So, you know, when it comes to diet, skincare regime, lifestyle, all of those factors come into play as well. And can you just give the practitioners a bit of advice on how they can sort of integrate that with the treatment plan as well? Yeah, of course. Um, I think that as we grow in aesthetics, aesthetics is a continuously evolving field. We're seeing advances in aesthetics every year, something new is coming, something which perhaps has been used only in surgical fields has now been crossed over into aesthetics. And actually to deliver the very best results, we need to be using a multimodality treatment. We need to be looking at the face as a full four layered structure of our skin, muscle, fat pads, and bone. And as we age, there are changes happening in each of those layers. So our skin's losing collagen, our muscles are becoming stronger, our fat pads are shrinking and slowly descending, and our bone structure shrinks. And the example I always give is, if you look at a photo of a man or a woman when they're 90 and compare it to when they were 20, we all get shorter as we age. Um, and your face structure also begins to shrink. So when we're looking at the face, and this is where it all comes back to a very, very detailed consultation, assessment plan and then developing a treatment plan that is tailored to our patient so botox is fantastic as an anti-wrinkle treatment botox used to be the most popular treatment in the world that's now started to become superseded by fillers because we learned that actually volume loss is causing a lot of changes within the face which botox cannot fix Mm. we're now emerging and we're seeing a trend where we're realizing that we need to also treat the surface of the skin to ensure our patients have nice, firm, even, bright looking skin. And then we're also starting to look at the face as a whole and realizing that we need to start offering advice to our patients about how they can maintain and and preserve the effects of the treatment for years to come. So obviously the industry has changed and developed over the last 10, 20 years as we've talked about. Where do you think it's actually headed now? Because at the moment, everybody, like you say, is wanting to look more rejuvenated, um, prevent aging, look healthier. So how do you think it's going to, what's the next step with the industry? That's what I'm trying to say. So as we go forward within aesthetics, where I see it going is that there no longer will be a single definition of beauty. So in the past, a patient would come in and we're assessing them based on geometry, projection, angles, and we're trying to create a look which is almost similar but with small tweaks. We're now starting, we're going to start seeing treatments which are very much individualized. So a patient might come in and even though we could perhaps put filler in one area, we're going to start looking at patients and thinking, do they actually need it? Will it affect their individuality? Will it affect their personality? and really tailoring a treatment um, to them in that aspect. And the other area, like I mentioned a little bit earlier in the podcast, will be looking at how a patient expresses themselves, looking at the, their emotions, looking at the aspect of them aside from when they're sitting still in front of us, and really tailoring a treatment to them in that aspect as well. So your advice to practitioners, would you say, is just to keep educating yourself, to be able of course. to... Of um, yeah. you know... Education, it should never end because the techniques that we're using now didn't even exist five or 10 years ago. When aesthetics very first started, every treatment was done with a needle. So you do a tear trough with a needle, which we would never even dream of doing now based upon safety profiles. Through education, we're also learning a lot more about how we can deliver natural looks without overfilling. And that's a very important concept. Sometimes with filler, all we think about is we're filling and lifting. What we're learning now is that we're actually retaining ligaments within the face. And by precise placements of filler in certain locations, we can actually create lift and shape without filling the face. And and that's very important if we want to leave our patients looking natural and subtle with their results. So education is important. And the great thing about education is you'll sometimes attend a course or a conference or a masterclass And even if you pick up on two or three little gems of knowledge, that will transform your practice. 
Um, education is not about completely relearning how you operate. It's about learning a new technique, a new style, and seeing how does that style fit within the way that I operate. And if you can do that year in, year out, you can find that your self-development grows. You're going to find that the results that you deliver become you know, exponentially better and better. And ultimately, it's all about delivering our patient very best results. 100%. No, I think that's amazing advice, to be honest. I think that I think a lot of practitioners feel pressured to train in absolutely everything. But if you just focus on what you enjoy doing and just keep trying to get better at it, then it's just going to make your, your job a lot more enjoyable. And as you say, it's going to make your clients really appreciate the work that you do as well. Um, and that is so, so important. Um, but just going back to Lumifil, just to finish off the podcast, we have some amazing Lumifil deals on the Faces app at the moment. Um, specifically, we've got some bundle deals, which very much ties in um, with Dr. Kataria with, you know, you can use eight mils of filler in one face um, if you're doing a non-surgical facelift or facial rejuvenation package. Um, so we've got some amazing deals as well as a skin booster called Cute cute gel hydro um which again do you want to just tell us a bit about as well just because you've not really talked about skin boosters yeah of course um skin boosters um are a really important aspect of treating the face so a skin booster is hyaluronic acid which is collagen it's injected within the dermis so just below the surface of the skin and what this does is it allows the skin to become firmer and more hydrated so research has shown us that one part of hyaluronic acid, it can actually hold 1,000 times its weight in water. Wow. And as we age, what we start to see is that our skin loses collagen, but also that the collagen fibres start to become a bit more disorganised. So we start to see fine lines, we start to see wrinkles, we start to see skin feeling dry and dehydrated. And this in turn will not allow you to give the very best result with filler. And the best analogy is like a balloon. The quality of the balloon will determine the ultimate look, not the amount of air that's being pumped inside the balloon. So um, skin boosters are something which I think should be combined with the dermal filler, um, really assessing our patient's skin and thinking, okay, looking at their skin, looking at the skin itself, could it do with a little bit more collagen? Could it do with a little bit more hydration? And sometimes you might find you don't need dermal filler. Sometimes you might find all you need is a skin booster. Sometimes you'll have patients who have been using medical grade skincare and you might think actually, okay, for this patient, they don't need skin booster. It's really looking and keeping every tool in your kit um, to give the patient the best result. Absolutely. And as you pointed out before in the podcast, that might change. You know, they might come back in Absolutely. and then you go, oh, actually, you know, I think we should go for this this time. So if you just keep educating yourself, not only are you going to keep the longevity of that client coming back to you because they trust you and, you know, you're giving them great results, um, but it also just means you've got more variety in terms of what you can offer them as well. Um, and it just, I think if I was a client and somebody was talking to me about my skin and going quite in depth about it, you know, I'd think, okay, they know what they're talking about. I trust them. So yeah, let's go for it um absolutely. yeah absolutely well thank you so much dr kataria for coming on the podcast no, thank really you, Molly. It's been really, really good. yeah we'll have to do it again as well and absolutely. if anyone has any questions feel free to drop um us a message on instagram or facebook if there's any specific guests that you want on the podcast as well please let me know because i'm always looking to get more people on and if you've got any questions for dr kataria feel free to fire them over um also lumi fill and volley fill and cute gel hydro are all available on the faces app under the pharmacy section we've got some amazing deals so if you're looking to get stocked up try some different techniques do some more training you know where to go so thank you so much and tune in next time i, I think another uh, so if there's any question we haven't covered